Hey there everyone, That Sexy Nerd is back again, and we're watching more uh, history buffs uh, with Marie Antoinette. I, I thought he covered the French Revolution, but I don't, actually, I don't think he did. Ugh. And this is probably everything before the French Revolution. I never watched this movie, but I do know somebody who did, and I hope she's watching. I really hope she's watching. Um, my little sister... When this movie came out, she would watch this movie on repeat for like an entire year. It was ridiculous for the little... <laughs> she would just keep watching this movie over and over and over and over again. And she's not used... She's not one to, to do that all the time. So she... <laughs> and I would be like, do you, are, you, are you even learning any history about this? And she's like, yeah. And especially because they, they chopped their, her her husband's head off. And I'm like, yeah, the French Revolution. But, you know, like, seriously, all it looked like was this girl being a Barbie doll. Like, trying to be all, like, you know, yeah, money, funny, fame, and all these dresses. And honestly, I didn't get that there was such a historical significance to that. Because <laughs> they, I didn't know they call her Madame Deficit. So... It, it, was, it was so interesting, and I honestly wish I did watch the movie. Uh, I don't think it's accurate, but I'm going to try and keep it uh, keep it together. But my sister's probably going to be like, I'll kill you. Mm. Yeah, y you don't want to mess with her at all. But anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, I don't want to talk about it anymore, so let's just get into the video. And remember, please, smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and nerdy content. And subscribe if you think I deserve it. And cat, this is one just for you. Hmm. Now let's do this thing, y'all. And remember... And you might want to powder up your hair and grab uh, a slice uh, of cake. Uh, because uh, today, we're yes. going to take a look at Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Based on the book Marie Antoinette, The Journey by Lady Antonia Fraser, uh. the 2006 film Marie Antoinette tells the true story of the reign of the last Queen of France. Mm. Born into the famous Habsburg family of Austria, Maria Antonia Josepha Joanna was destined to be married off to Europe's greatest royal family, the Bourbons of France. She was to be wed to Louis Auguste, the future what? king Louis XVI, Is that who unites their houses. But Marie Antoinette would have a complicated relationship with her new French subjects. At first, they were unsure of this little Austrian girl. Was she a spy? Could she be loyal to France? Despite these concerns, the people fell in love with a naive young Dauphine. But as conditions worsened in France, they grew to hate her. Ooh. As an outsider, Marie Antoinette became a symbol for all of France's problems, uh. like social inequality and an economy in shambles. Oh boy, we can identify right now that whenever something goes wrong, they always blame maybe the source, but not the main source of their problems. Republicans. And as these tensions climbed, so did the people's hatred of their queen. But how much was Marie Antoinette really to blame? Did her lifestyle bankrupt France? Did she truly contribute to the decline of the French monarchy? Or was she just a scapegoat? Ooh. Well, join me as we take a look at Sophia yeah. Coppola's Marie Both. Antoinette, and I'll reveal which parts are made up and which parts are true. Mm, and considering the movie was based on the book, a lot of the real history had to be condensed for the big screen. So I'll try to fill in the gaps and give you a sense of her life and reveal how she turned from a beloved young Dauphine to a hated queen in just 19 years living at Versailles. This is Marie Antoinette. OMG. When the movie begins, we see a young Marie Antoinette approach the French border where she is met by the Comtesse de Noailles. As the head of a household, Marie would come to call her Madame Etiquette in the years to come because it was her job to teach the young Dauphine how to behave and act in a future home of Versailles. We then see Marie embrace the Comtesse de Noailles uh, and, as accurately depicted, the Comtesse was shocked by this move as this conduct broke the very rigid etiquette expected of Versailles royals. We also meet the Comte de Mercy Argentou, an Austrian diplomat who oh. traveled with Marie Antoinette to this... France to serve as her advisor. Although he was there to help guide the young Dauphine, he was, above all else, on a mission to secure and protect the Franco-Austrian alliance. And in the movie, Mercy informs Marie Antoinette that they've arrived at Chuturn, where the Dauphine will formally cross into France. However, this is inaccurate. <laughs> Though the caravan did stay at Chuturn Abbey the night before the handover ceremony, 
The event itself took place on an island on the Rhine River near Kale, well, just prettier. across the border from Strasbourg. Now, as to why they changed this detail, my guess is that it was just simply cheaper to film in the woods. Uh... But in any case, the idea of a ceremony at the border is true. The Comtesse de Noyer explains it to the young Dauphin. This structure for the handover ceremony has been built precisely Dauphin. astride the borders of the two great lands. You have entered on Austrian soil, you will exit on French as the Dauphin of France. Now you must bid farewell to your party and leave all of Austria behind. And the Comtesse means this, literally, because at the time, France and Austria, the heart of the Holy Roman Empire, shared a border. Oh. Whereas today, France and Austria are separated by Germany and Switzerland. Right. But at the time, Strasbourg sat right between the two, making the perfect choice for the ceremony. And wow. it was here between- He needs to whip out the maps more often. I need to know where these borders were at because like every single time he, he needs, he names something geographical like that, I'm at a total loss, but he needs to whip out the maps more often the Holy Roman Empire and France that Marie Antoinette had to leave everything behind. Puppy. And they weren't kidding. They even make her leave a dog Mops. What? <laughs> Mops. Oh, how dare you? You can have as many French dogs as you like. <gasps> Fortunately no! for all you dog lovers out there, I'm happy to say that she did end up getting Mops back in real life. Oh. Mercy was the one who helped negotiate for his later arrival. I was so angry there for a second. <laughs> like, why? These French people have the stupidest rules. Let's not forget, these people for hundreds of years watched whomever got married in their household. You remember Game of Thrones? The whole, um, what do you call it? The, the whole betting ceremony and whatever? Guess where they got that from? It wasn't from England. Anyway, we then see Marie Antoinette symbolically and, well, actually stripped of her Austrian clothing, and she dons new French ones. The Comtesse de Nouai tells her that it is customary that nothing belonging to a foreign court can be brought into France and Versailles. And, as accurately depicted, Marie Antoinette doesn't seem bothered by this Ooh. at all. Growing up as an Archduchess, she would have been used to being dressed and pampered like this. What? Girls in Marie Antoinette's position had very little privacy. As Antonia Fraser put it in her book, and I quote, She had, after all, been treated as a doll to be dressed up in this and that at the adult swim since childhood. Ooh. This was just one more example of that process. This is ridiculous. You need this a French accent or Madame Austrian accent. Is Versailles. Versailles. After yes, the yes, France is ridiculous. I'm sorry, but the royal family... These people were, everybody, all the, I, I thought England was insane, but these people had some crazy, stupid rules. Like, why? Tent, she travels to meet her husband, Louis Auguste. She also meets the King of France, Louis XV, and a bunch of other family members like the King's daughters and her new aunts. This is all pretty much on point, even down to some of the more memorable lines, like when she greets the man who helped make the marriage happen, the Duc de Choiselle. Uh -oh. I shall never forget that you were responsible for my happiness. And that of France. This was a well-documented exchange, so it's nice to see the movie get it right. Really? This film does a pretty good job with famous quotes, and takes care to include a lot of small details like this. As the Dauphine approaches a huh. new grand... I'm, I'm already very impressed by this movie. I'm honestly shocked. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know, maybe I, oh, wow. Maybe it just makes me look different as a person because man, I just judged this movie for being a, another girly girl movie, but I didn't know anything about the history. I did, I heard about it in school, but I'm telling you, I have learned more about history and anything from YouTube, uh, more than I have in, in any of my high school classes at least. In college, yeah, I, I learned some things, but Never pay, never could uh, retain this stuff. Here, I could retain it all the time. Father and King, we hear the King's daughters, her new aunts, already gossiping about her. Here comes the Austrian. I know him. Oh, that's Retorn. I hope you like apple strudel. Oh, what? Molly Shannon? And this nasty little move was unfortunately commonplace at first sight. 
Despite the fact that the royal aunts never really liked the new Dauphine, Marie Antoinette would end up spending a lot of time in their chambers, which was customary given her position. Well, and just like how the Comte de Mercy sucks. influenced Marie Antoinette to make decisions that would benefit Austria, so too would the royal aunts guide her for their own sakes. When Marie Antoinette arrives at Compiègne, she first meets with a very charming King Louis XV. Mm. But when she meets her husband, Louis Auguste, he is much less so. Yes. In fact, this first glimpse of him highlights some of the hallmark personality traits of Louis Auguste. The future King Louis XVI of France. Quiet, shy, and frankly, a bit dull. By the way, a small nitpick here, but the real Louis Auguste was a much larger fellow. Yes, I mean, fact. the actor Jason Schwartzman does a fine job of betraying the Dauphin. That's his name, Jason Sw Swartz from that show, Ridiculous. And he's a good actor. He's just really good at, at being his own special kind of crazy. Y yeah. And standoffishness. But he doesn't quite capture his physical size. Louis Auguste was yeah. described as being quite fat. <laughs> It only grew fatter over time, yeah. apparently a Bourbon family trait. Louis Auguste also kept a hunting journal where he'd write down important events in his life. By the time he met his wife in person, he had already kept this journal for four years. But what did he write on the day he met his wife, Nothing. the lovely and fair Marie Antoinette, for the first time? Meeting with Madame la Dauphine. How romantic. From this chilly reception, Marie Antoinette heads to her new home, blissfully unaware of the complexities of Versailles court life ahead of her. Speaking of navigating unfamiliar situations, I want to introduce today's sponsor, The relationship between Marie Antoinette and her husband started off cold, and remained that way for years. Famously, on the night of the marriage ceremony, they never consummated, and rumours quickly spread throughout Versailles the next day. Apparently, nothing happened, Your Majesty. Nothing? Nothing. No return. Nothing. 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 Oh dear. Now, though Louis Auguste was initially not interested in his marriage, he did have three other passions. History, hunting, and locksmithing. We mm. see the latter two in the movie. He often goes and hunts with other members of the court, and he briefly discusses locksmithing with Marie Antoinette. You know... I, I love how everybody's like, ooh, hunting is such a manly thing. But it just seems like every single time one of these kings has a hunting fetish or anything, he's definitely not banging his wife. What is the correlation? Is it just as satisfying? Ugh. So, I've heard you make keys as a hobby? Also, they're fat. Yes. Oh. And you enjoy making keys? Obviously. There was very little privacy in the yeah. day-to-day -day lives of the newlywed royals. That's probably in fact, why. it took seven years before they finally consummated their marriage. Seven the years? The big question, of course, is why? Was it because he wasn't interested in her? Well, throughout the movie, we see Louis turn from her in bed, sometimes apologizing, sometimes coming up with excuses. It gets to a point where King Louis XV, three years after their wedding, calls in a doctor to check if the Dauphin is even capable oh, of producing no. a child. But the doctor reported that there was no physical reasons why the couple couldn't do the deed. <laughs> this is so funny. I, I enjoy this show called Serpent Queen. Watch it. Check it out. It's on Stars. It is fantastic. Uh, especially if you guys love history or just people stabbing in the back. Honestly, it's... What's the term? It's bootleg Game of Thrones. And I mean that in the best possible way. I do. I mean that in the best possible way. No dragons, basically. And no magic. That's, well, yeah, actually there is magic, but whatever. So why was there so much interest in the relationship between this young couple? Well, for one, if the couple had a boy, he'd one day become the Dauphin of France. For a long time after Marie Antoinette and Louis Auguste got married, there was no next generation of Bourbon boys to become future heirs to the throne. But the pressure didn't just come from the French side. The Empress, Maria Theresa, was also oh! keen to see an Austrian grandchild um, born into Maria. the French monarchy. In the movie, we see several moments where the Empress writes to her daughter, and these words are taken from the actual letters between the mother and daughter. No! And some of these letters were, what's the nicest way of saying this? Direct. 
Dearest Antoinette, oh, no. it is clear that the heart of your problems in your new home is your inability to inspire sexual passion in your husband. There is no reason a girl with so many charms as you should be in this situation. It's not her fault. Remember, you represent the future and nothing is certain about your place there until the final physical act to crown the Franco-Austrian alliance is performed. It's not her fault, literally, because what is she gonna do? Get a guy who's not interested in her uh, to, bang, to bang her? Yeah. Guess how that goes the other way around. Meanwhile, as Marie Antoinette tries and Idiots. fails to get the attention of her shy husband, she gets used to life at Versailles. Nah, we I'm see sure this happen did. gradually throughout the movie as she adopts French fashions and pleasures. But if we're going to talk about fashion, we've got to talk about the hair and the yeah, rouge. Yeah, there it is. Now, although Marie Antoinette is today synonymous with those big coiffed hairstyles from this period, the practice was already commonplace at Versailles before she arrived. In fact, by 1770, when she first came to France, one wouldn't come to court without heavily powdered hair or yeah. at least a wig. <laughs> These wigs, called uh, perukes, uh -huh. became popular in France with King Louis XIV. Though they existed before as a way of covering up boldness, especially boldness caused by syphilis outbreaks that plagued Ooh, early modern Europe, yeah. they became stylish when the Sun King himself started wearing them. Not only were they fashionable, but practical, especially <laughs> since head lice are much more easily removed from a wig than your own hair. So not what? only do we see everyone wearing these powdered wigs at court, but they get bigger over time. <laughs> I mean, look at the size of this hair, dude. Wow. Heavy rouge was also very fashionable in France, and it wasn't just a little bit of dabbed onto the cheeks, but big circles of red painted Ooh. right on. The idea was the more rouge on your cheek, the more your eyes stand out. By 1780, around 2 million pots of rouge were used each year by French women. When Marie first arrived, she was kind towards everyone. After all, she was new to Versailles and didn't know the social hierarchy. But what over the time, the people around her started to influence her and how she should behave. The best example of this is when she first meets King Louis XV's mistress, the Madame du Barry. It was common knowledge that du Barry was the king's mistress because he brought her everywhere. Du Barry was actually the king's third mistress brought into Versailles in 1769. The king's wife, by the way, had died by this point, yeah. but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Affairs and liaisons at court were pretty common and generally yeah. accepted. What? Hey, rude. That was unnecessary. Just like we see in the movie, the real Marie Antoinette did not get on with Dubarry. But the question thought... is, if the Dauphine was adjusting to life at Versailles, why should she be so against this one aspect of it? Or does she have a personal grudge with Dubarry? Now, there are several what? reasons for Marie Antoinette's feelings towards the Madame de Barry, but the bulk of it lies with her royal aunts. As uh... the king's daughters, they despise this woman who moved in and encouraged their father's favor, and, as accurately depicted, they held tremendous influence over Marie Antoinette. In the hopes of having strong bonds with the women around her, as she once had with her older sister Ew. Charlotte, Marie was eager to do as her new What's aunt's asked, face? snubbing de Barry whenever she had the chance. De Barry is dreadful. Dreadful. The way she dresses. Oh, she thinks she's dreadful. Is. Yes, she does. And those ridiculous pet monkeys. Where does she come from? From every bed in Paris. And Ooh. I don't want to say this, but I don't think that she has greeted you with respect. That's just my opinion. No. A little later in the movie, we see Du Barry come up to speak with Marie Antoinette. Now, Jeez. court etiquette and social hierarchy dictated that Du Barry cannot speak with the Dauphine first. Marie would have to initiate conversation. Though it's clear that Marie Antoinette knew she had to speak with Du Barry first, Ooh. she instead looks at her aunt's shoes and starts a side conversation with them about fashion. De Barry takes the hint and leaves the room. The aunts are pleased that Marie Antoinette snubbed their father's mistress, and the Dauphine is just happy that someone is happy with her. However, Mercy, oh. her advisor, strongly discourages Marie behaving this way. Snubbing the king's favorite is publicly criticizing the king's behavior. That is true. All you need to do is say a few words to her. Because of rank, she is not allowed to speak to you first. Well, I certainly have nothing to say to her. And why should I approve of his cavorting with a harlot? Your that's royal true. highness. Well, that's what she is. Everyone knows that she's from a brothel and that title was bought for her. Your mother and I are very concerned. Dubarry has been complaining to the king that you will not address her and you cannot afford to fall out of favor with the king. 
Especially as your marriage, not exactly on solid ground. Oof. Now you might think something as trivial as this must surely be the stuff of Hollywood fiction. No! But no, this little tiff between them and how it played out is absolutely true. Like, you know how petty teenage girls or girls in general are? Of course this shit is real. Like, and it would really mess up uh, court etiquette and actually have real uh, consequences. Of course it would. It... The pettiest, stupidest, and it's not even just reserved to women. Some of the pettiest, stupidest things have were 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 the like you know started big wars and whatever. Like let's not forget the pig war that the, that the United States and uh, England nearly went to war over the shooting of a pig. At the behest of Mercy, her advisor Marie begrudgingly makes a small gesture towards Dubarry. She says one quick line to her about the amount of people in Versailles, then walks away. Apparently, that was enough to publicly recognize Dubarry, gain the king's favor, and play court politics. But to go back to that last line from Mercy about her marriage being on shaky ground, that is really the crux of all of this. Marie Antoinette is in a new place with a shy husband who won't give her children. She's facing pressure Aww. from her mother, the Empress, to control affairs in court in favor of Austria. Seven years. Seven years you go without none. And the only close friends she has are the Princess de Lombel and the Duchess of Polignac. And it didn't help that Louis's younger brother had a child first, beginning the next generation of French kings. Which only makes it more scandalous that Marie and Louis still haven't consummated oh, no. their marriage. However, there's a big inaccuracy <clears throat> here. The film shows the Comte and Comtesse de Provence having a child. The Comte de Provence, by the way, is Louis Auguste's younger brother, Louis Stanislas. Mm. Yeah, I know it's confusing trying to remember which Louis is which, just bear with me. Anyway, There's like the entirety of the French line is full of nothing but Louis, and it wasn't just the Bourbons. Louis was a name, there's a reason why there's 16 Louis, like, or, or something like that, man, it's crazy. In reality, it wasn't the Comte and Comtesse de Provence who had this child, but Louis's youngest brother, Charles Philippe, and his wife, the Comte and Comtesse de Artois. As to why they made this change, I haven't got a clue, because eh. both of Louis's brothers are in the movie. In any case, Marie Antoinette's really nephew's arrival only increases the pressure to produce an heir of her own. And, as accurately depicted in the movie, to escape all this tension, Marie Antoinette turned to excessive shopping and gambling to help battle the loneliness and isolation. Uh... For Marie Antoinette, deeply unhappy in her loveless marriage to a seemingly disinterested husband, these were ways of escaping reality. Well, As the Dauphine, so... she could have anything she wanted, so she started to spend. I need to point out though that the Duchess de Polignac didn't come to Versailles and become close friends with Marie Antoinette Rose until Byrne? after she was queen. So while they did all party together, it wasn't until much later on. Another outlet was the opera. Not only did Marie Antoinette support and visit the opera throughout her time in France, both in Paris and at Versailles, but just like we see in the movie, she even sang in the opera once she became queen. Really? She also blew off steam by, of course, partying. There's a scene where the Duchess de Polignac suggests they go to a masked ball. The group sneaks away to have some fun, and it's here that Marie Antoinette meets the man who later became her alleged lover, oh. Count Axel von Fersen of Sweden. Is but the real affair, if it even happened, didn't begin until much later on. There's still debate on whether or not they had a physical affair, but what is undeniable is that the two became very close. Now, in the movie, huh. when the group returns home... It's not the guy from You, is it? I think that was the guy from You. ...for the ball, they learn that King Louis XV is sick. In reality, this didn't happen on the same night. The masked ball was on January 30th, 1774, whereas the king didn't fall ill until April 1774. And while I'm on the subject, the film doesn't portray the passage of time very well. Uh. I understand that it's hard to fit 19 years of Marie Antoinette's life at Versailles into a two-hour movie, but there's no way to judge how quickly time passes. Sure, you could see grey hairs appear on the men after a while, but without knowing the actual history beforehand, the audience would have no context for when these events happened in real life. By May 3rd, 1774, it was clear that the king had smallpox. But what we don't see in the movie is that during this time, Louis Auguste had to be quarantined. You see, Marie Antoinette was given a smallpox variolation when she was a small child. 
so she contracted and recovered from a very mild form of the disease. Oh. But Louis Auguste was never exposed to smallpox, so he was at risk of getting sick. Both he and Marie Antoinette quarantined for six months away from Versailles. Knowing that he was dying, the king had to put his affairs in order before he passed. The biggest issue was Dubarry, his mistress. To preserve his spiritual afterlife, he needed to fully repent for all his sins. And for the French, he this also meant away. banishing mistresses. We see this happen in the movie too. Dubarry sent away, and Marie Antoinette oh, never needs to properly reconcile with her. King Louis XV died a week later on May the 10th. 1774. 19-year-old mm. Louis Auguste and 18-year-old Marie Antoinette were now the king and queen of France. Mm. Dear God, guide us and protect us. We are too young to reign. Yes. Yes, you are. In the beginning, things didn't change too much for Marie Antoinette. Sure, she was queen now, but her life was still filled with parties and luxury. Her 18th birthday, for example, was a major event with gambling, excessive drinking, a huge cake, foreign entertainment, and wait, did the Duchess de Polignac just snort cocaine? What? To be fair, I suppose that could have been snuff, which is finely ground tobacco leaves. Just one snort of that gives you a quick you can't hit do that. That's But not I don't there think either. they would have been brazenly bumping lines like this out in the open. Well, not at this party anyway. Thing is, unlike in the movie's timeline, King Louis XV was still alive at this point and had long since banned snuff from Versailles, and Marie Antoinette turned 18 six months before King Louis XV's death, so it would have been prudent for her guests to snub the snuff rules just yet. But back to what I was saying. The parties, the mask ball, the gambling, much of it were Marie Antoinette's efforts to mask her isolation and loneliness, albeit expensive efforts. At one point in the movie, Mercy scolds Marie Antoinette for her spending habits. Your Majesty, you have spent over 50,000 already this month. Okay. There is nothing left to give to your charities. Oh, Your oh. Majesty, Leonard is here to fit your new wigs. All right. Mercy isn't <clears throat> wrong. She was spending too much money. The film accurately shows us the true extravagance of Marie Antoinette's lifestyle, even the wasted food left behind. It wasn't just the parties or the That's gambling terrible. or the shopping that cost a fortune. The Queen's household was huge. She had about 500 people in a personal staff. It cost 4 million livres to run. That's an obscene amount of money. That's equivalent to several Jesus. hundred million dollars today. All of it was paid wow. for by the minister of the royal household. And guess where that money came from? The common the people, people, yep. The nobility and the clergy in pre-revolutionary France were largely exempt from paying taxes. Mm. So this lavish lifestyle that every Just like today, the rich are exempt from paying taxes. Thanks, Republicans. Everyone at Versailles led, all of it bought and paid for by France's taxes yes, on the is. commoners. And don't even get me started on the coronation. The new king and queen spent exorbitant amounts on it, despite their controller general finance at the time advising them against it. France's economy was in shambles after the Seven Years' oh, War. Boy. There was a 22 million livre deficit, with a projected 78 million more to come. Jesus. And it didn't help that there was a bad grain harvest in 1774, which led to bread shortages. It was in very poor taste to spend so much money on the coronation when their people were starving. Things got so bad that the flower war broke out the same year. A general protest over the lack of food and the terrible economy. By the way, you know how loads of people attribute to that famous line, let them eat cake, to Marie Antoinette? And when they went to the queen to tell her her subject had no bread, do you know what she said? Let, let them, them eat cake. cake. Oof. That's such nonsense. I would never say that. She's right, there's no evidence she ever said that. Mm. In fact, this was a line attributed to lots of royal women throughout history. One example is Marie Theresa of Spain, really? the wife of King Louis XIV. And her mother. Allegedly, Marie Theresa said, let the people no, eat wait. la croûte de pâté, or the crust of the pâté, in response to the French people starving during her time. But if Marie Antoinette did say her famous line, Antonia Fraser, the author of the book this movie is based on, believes it would have been here 
during the Flower War. Really? Regardless of whether she said it or not, the reason it still resonates with people today is because it's the perfect metaphor of the indifference and ignorance by the elite towards the poor and hungry. I, I figured that it, she had actually said that. I don't know. I guess I went off of oversimplified, but I thought they that she said it after, like when they after they had uh, stormed the Bastille and everything, and they were trying to figure everything out in the middle of that. But in any case, the spending at Versailles really was that bad, and it made the economy even worse. The four million livre was just Marie Antoinette's household. The king's was even bigger. And then you also need to factor in all the other royals living there too. Louis' aunts, his younger brothers, their wives, and his new nephew. There were a lot of people living at Versailles. It See, anger, this kind of anger, never has a, any sense. All they do, all she was, really, was a scapegoat. It's true. I mean, yeah, she spent a lot, but look at all these other retards that have to live with her. I mean, look at all these other idiots that have to live with her. It was an expensive place to run. Now, because the film really just focuses on Marie Antoinette, there is so much political and social context missing from the movie. Yeah, I bet For you example, there is. the only time we see any French commoners is at the very end, and even Re then, it's just their silhouettes from behind. But uh -huh. to get a clearer picture of Marie Antoinette, to understand why they were chased out of Versailles and eventually decapitated during the French Revolution, we need this context. We need to see how the French people felt about her. I mean, that's what I heard about this movie. I had heard that they didn't focus too much on everything else. It was just all about her and it all pretends to be about her. And the way my sister was acting, it just felt like one big party that this movie was. Boy, was I wrong. I mean, we certainly know how the people at court felt. In the movie, you can hear people in the hallways of Versailles bitching about her, saying stuff like, it's barren, what do you expect? Barren. Said she's barren? Give us an air. And comments like these were said in real life. So it's no surprise that Marie Antoinette buried herself in the company of her close friends, in her parties, and in going to the opera. But she also went out to engage with her people, at least initially before they turned on her. For example, Marie Antoinette had a soft spot for kids. In real life, she once pseudo adopted an orphaned boy from a nearby village and gave him a Versailles education. Oh. That's why the let them eat cake line doesn't really work for Marie Antoinette. Mm. She loved her people and would be more likely to give them her own cake or brioche if she knew they were starving. But it's not just the commoners missing from the movie. Politics and some conflicts are barely mentioned. And some really important events are just completely left out. Like oh, the no. diamonds necklace affair of 1784, which worsened Marie Antoinette's public image. Hmm? In one scene, what we happened? see King Louis XVI at a council meeting to discuss what to do about the American Revolution. Louis uh, was notoriously indecisive as yeah. king. His finance minister, who at this time was Jacques Necker, encouraged him to support the Americans. The Americans hmm. are asking for help in their revolution. Hmm. Well, I can't exactly see assisting those who are rejecting their sovereign. But it would make a strong statement to England. As well. Can our finances take the strain? Oh, no. taxes will be raised slightly. I recommend we help our American brothers. Slightly. And show the rest of Europe our strength. All right, then. Send funds to America. The general gist of the scene here is accurate. The French did lend money and troops to support the American Revolution. Although it would be expensive, the French wanted to take this opportunity to hurt their main enemy at the time, the England. British. But the whole situation was much more complex than the movie makes it seem. First, there were a lot of different finance ministers that came and went based on court politics and public opinion. Acting as if the, a decision like this takes like five freaking minutes. That, that would have at least taken like two, two hours, maybe. Right before Jacques Necker was a man named Anne Robert Jacques Turgot. He was the one who recommended the new king and queen not spend so much on their coronation. He also believed that the French should not help the Americans as the nah. economy was already in shambles after the Seven Years' War. Oh, the, See where I'm going with this? Turgo was then dismissed in May 1776 and Jacques Necker was brought on board. 
and he took out foreign loans to help support the American Revolution, only worsening France's economic situation in the Ooh. long run. Meanwhile, during all the stuff we don't see, the king and queen are spending even more money tricking out the gardens of Versailles, particularly with the Petit Triangle. Marie Antoinette longed for a place where she could rebuild the gardens of her childhood manors, so her husband gifted her the Petit Triangle, a palace originally commissioned by Louis XV. It was here oh. that Marie Antoinette spent a good chunk of her time away from the main palace of Versailles. I get it. And away from the reminders that her husband had still not consummated their marriage. Oh and on that topic, the people were growing restless. Oh. It was odd that seven years into the marriage, the king and queen had still not produced an heir. But as I accurately stated in the movie, that all changed after Emperor Joseph II, Marie Antoinette's older brother, visited the king and coached him how to perform step by step. So, I thought we. Oh no. And, you know, you had to have the elephant trunk grabbing him while saying that, right? The most phallic animal. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> Could have a little talk about the marriage pad. Oh no. Axe Man, please don't the take advance from him. Good. Advice from him. What goes on exactly? Is that a sword? I I don't know. It's like I understand you have a certain passion for locks. Yes. Well, no. Sometimes when a key doesn't no. quite fit. <laughs> Trust me, guys. As awkward as this sounds, I promise you, the truth is more cringy than fiction. Oh no! In a letter to his brother Leopold, Emperor Joseph described when Louis confided in him of when he tried to have sex with Marie, and I quote. The French king had well-conditioned strong erections and introduced his member, stayed there for two minutes without moving, withdrew without ejaculation, and then still erect, wished his wife good <laughs> evening. He should be whipped like a donkey to make him discharge in anger. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, and this is real. This is real life, man. <laughs> Why? You, you can't. Why? Why? What is it about royalty that they're just the weirdest people? All of them. Why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. In case, on August 30th, 1777, uh. the most awkward couple in history had finally done the deed. It's about damn time. I mean, she wants to get laid. In April of 1778, Marie Antoinette was pregnant. Later that year, on December 19, 1778, the king and queen had their first child, a girl named Maria Theresa Charlotte, a nod to her powerful mother no, and her Maria sister Teresa. and childhood best friend. Marie Antoinette had finally become a mother. Now, a lot of details in this scene are pretty accurate. For example, there were that many people there to witness the birth. It's also true that Marie Antoinette fell unconscious from the lack of air and they had to open the window to wake her back up. And when they discovered the first child is a girl, Marie Antoinette says this in the movie. Poor little girl. You are not what was desired, but you are no less dear to me. <laughs> okay. A boy would be the son of France, but you, Marie Therese, be it's not word for word what she said in real life, which was again very well documented, but it's close enough and captures the sentiment. Reminds the young child was given the nickname Madame Royale. Becoming a mother marked a significant change in her life, which we could see visually and accurately portrayed in the movie. Gone are the party scenes, the excess, the drinking and the what? gambling. Instead, we see Marie Antoinette change her style completely. She dresses in simple white linens, spends time with the daughter outside the gardens of the Petit Triangle, and tries to return to a simpler life in nature. Now, just a few things here. Once again, the passage of time is confusing. We jump from the newborn Madame Royale to a little girl of around two or three years old in about three what? minutes of screen time. And again, I know they're trying to present 19 years of Marie Antoinette's life in just under two hours, and some things need to be sped up. 
But if the film perhaps explained what year it was with some on-screen titles, then that could have provided some much needed context. Hmm. It's also in this phase of her life that we see Marie Antoinette reacquaint herself with the Swedish Count von mm, Fersen, yeah, who's just come home from fighting with the Americans. But again, the timing of this is wrong. To show you what I mean, when King Louis XVI visits his wife at the Petit Triangle, he says this. Come home. We're having a ball for the soldiers who fought in America. So this would have been when the French troops returned from fighting around 1783. And it was in 1783, at least in real life, when Fersen and the Queen spent the summer together, probably having an affair, but at the very minimum, enjoying each other's company. Mm. The problem is that the movie shows us happening way too early, because at the time Fersen was away fighting in the American <laughs> War of Independence, two big events happened. First, the Empress Marie Theresa of Austria died in 1780, oh, and yeah, second, right. the Queen had a second child in October of 1781, a boy, Louis hey. Joseph, the new Dauphin of France. The film puts these events after Fursa returns from America and leaves again, which is inaccurate. When Fursa leaves Marie Antoinette after their summer together, he goes off to serve Gustavus III of Sweden for a year Ooh. before returning to Versailles. He then stays with the royal family until finally fleeing the French Revolution in 1791. Mm. Basically, the movie just conflates all these events together to build this narrative of Marie falling in love and having a liaison despite being against them when she first arrived, as evidenced by how she treated Madame de Barry. He amuses her and she likes to be amused. There's nothing unregal in that man. Hey, Tom Hardy? Now, while all of this- well, What did she say? There's nothing unregal in that, Monsieur. Uh, now, while all of this is going on, we do get little hints of the worsening political situation in Paris, where the people Idiot. are starving. We see Louis meet with his finance minister and various other councillors, who basically tell him this. Problem of the debt is grave, your majesty. People of France are hungry. Sending troops to America is costing more than what we estimated. But we can't let England win. We must show our strength. We will continue aid to the Americans. Now, the timing of this conversation doesn't make sense, but it was a genuine concern. Supporting the Americans was putting France into further debt. It seems like these that serve to remind us about what was really going on behind the scenes. Because in the movie, we never get to actually see the state of France's decline. The starvation, the desperation, the riots, all of that happens off screen. To be fair, though, this is a, um, a depiction of the royals point of view of the whole thing and if you guys didn't know they don't they're not in paris they're not in uh technically in in the city they're all the way in versailles which is miles away and so they they don't even know what the people are uh what, what the people are going through I, I i bet you they're gonna mention the, that marie antoinette was shocked that they were starving so much when when they finally you know came for her Marie Antoinette is told that the people are starving, but she doesn't know how to help. Oh. This is true in real life as well. She there was never go. great with politics, and Mercy was often frustrated by her inability to play the game. The French can be fickle, and uh, Her Majesty would do well to be more attentive. Life is getting harder for the people of France. The bread shortage is grave. Well, there must be something the king can do to ease their sufferings. But by this point, there wasn't much to be done. Things are alleviated, slightly, with the birth of the new Dauphin of France, Louis-Joseph. After seeing his son for the first time, Louis told Marie this. Madame, you have fulfilled our wishes and those of France. You are the mother of a Dauphin. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside of Versailles, the French people are momentarily ecstatic. Marie Antoinette feels fulfilled, no, she's given birth to the new Dauphin and has done what her mother sent her out to do. Her son, the heir to the throne, is part French and part Austrian. And then the movie does another time jump. In one scene, the new baby Dauphin is being paraded through Versailles, and then in literally the next, the Dauphin is a few years older, where we see Marie Antoinette and her two children posing for a picture. However, yeah. the painting in question is inaccurate. The real painting is called Marie Antoinette with her two eldest children, Marie Therese Charlotte and the Dauphin Louis Joseph in the gardens of the Petit Triangle, and it was painted by Swedish painter Adolf Ulrich Wertmöller in 1785. Wow. 
Not by whoever Shh, this lady is. What? And look, it's flipped from the original. In any oh. case, despite producing the new Dauphin of France, Whatever. the public quickly turn against Marie again. But instead of showing an angry population of commoners, the film decides to just scroll text over a fake portrait of the Queen. Really? The deficit, Queen of Debt, spending France into ruin. Uh. This change in public opinion is best demonstrated when she goes to the opera. Earlier in the movie, there's a scene that really happened when she clapped after a performance. The thing is, clapping was not normally done at the opera. So when this happened, people looked at her strangely. But she was so charming that the audience clapped along. Oh. It was one of those early moments that helped Marie Antoinette feel more at home in France. But later in the movie, when she claps after a particularly moving aria, the crowd just stares at her with disdain. And then it finally clicks in her head. Marie Antoinette now understands that public opinion has changed. A luxurious lifestyle, her unrestricted spending has made her a scapegoat for all of France's problems, oh, especially that sad. she is and always will be the Austrian, a foreign queen. It's a really good scene Stupid. and historically authentic. Anyway, after that bit in the opera, we see a new portrait put on the walls. Because off screen, Marie Antoinette has had another child. It's soon replaced by another, and this portrait, like the last one, is slightly off. It's meant to be Marie Antoinette and her children <laughs> painted by Elizabeth Louis Vigie Lafont in 1787. But this time, I know why the painting is different. In real life, Marie Antoinette had four children, whilst in the movie, they only show her with three. Why? The King and Queen's third child was born in March of 1785, another boy named Louis Charles. This wow. third boy was healthy, unlike the Dauphin who was always sickly. They never show any of this in the movie. Because in real life, the little Dauphin's health deteriorated over time, so much so that the family eventually moved him to the Chateau of Moudon where he was secluded in the hopes of recovering peacefully from his illness, tuberculosis of, of the spine. Oh, no. So this portrait, the real one anyway, shows the oldest daughter, Marie Therese Charlotte, on the Queen's left, the sickly Dauphin, Louis Joseph on the right, the third child, Louis Charles on the Queen's lap, and the Dauphin pointing towards an empty bassinet. Oh. It was painted just after their fourth child, Sophie, died. Whilst the new portrait of the film copies the real one with only two children and the empty bassinet. The next scene in the film that is the child's sucks. burial. Since time and context no. this movie is a problem, we don't know whose funeral this is. The sickly seven and a half year old Dauphin or the baby Sophie. It's hard to know for certain, but based on what happens next, I'm pretty sure that this burial was meant to be the Dauphin, mm. the sickly Louis Joseph, and the baby Sophie was just completely omitted altogether. <laughs> the thing is that young Louis Joseph died a month before the storming of the Bastille, and the scene oh. after the funeral sequence is when the king and queen learn about it. Now, what we don't see in the movie, and again, the mm. missing context is really important here, Rosefield. is that for months, the king had been attempting to appease the newly formed National Assembly, made up of political National leaders Assembly. from the Third Estate. But due to his indecisiveness, and frankly, having never received a proper education on how to govern, it didn't go well. Oh, jeez. So when Prisian stormed the Bastille on July 14th, 1789, Louis' advisors recommended that the king and queen as well as all the other members of the royal family should flee. Louis' response? Yeah. Yes, they must go. They must go. Say. Certainly the royal family must find somewhere more secure. Hmm. Metz is one of the strongest fortresses in Europe. You will not be safe here. I will see to it that my mistresses are off at once. But my place is here with my husband. In reality, the king was considering going to Metz, but his younger brother, Louis Stanislas, convinced him to stay. In her oh, book, oh. Antonia Fraser notes that the king later told Count von Fersen, yes, the affair partner von Fersen, that he regretted not leaving at that moment. The king sadly said, and I quote, I missed my opportunity, and it never came again. In both the movie and in real life, the king and queen stay in Versailles, saying goodbye to their family and friends. And suddenly, in a beautiful parallel to the beginning of the film, Marie Antoinette finds herself alone once again. Things began to go downhill very quickly. The food scarcity problem in Paris only got worse, oh, the and the hell? bread riots began. Oh. On October the 5th, 1789, Parisian market women marched yeah, to Versailles, awesome. primarily to demand grain or flour. 
but secondarily to urge the king to relinquish some of his powers in favor of the new Declaration of the Rights of Man and hey. of the Citizen, drafted by the National Assembly. Once again, there are talks that the king and queen and their two remaining children should flee, but still, they decided to stay. I will not be a fugitive king. It is too dangerous here. At least send the queen and children. My place is at the king's side. Just take notice of how the queen looks here, compared to the They're height smaller. of her party years. This film, though not always historically accurate, does a masterful job of visual storytelling. In real life, the market women arrived, and Louis told them where to find two granaries to help alleviate the bread crisis. But it was too little, too late. The crowd had changed their purpose. They were no longer satisfied with getting wheat. They wanted Marie Antoinette's head. They also wanted to take the king from Versailles and have him stay in Paris, where the people could keep an eye on him. Well. In the movie, we can hear the mob approach overnight, and this is accurate as the attack came at 4 a.m. We then AM. see the queen flee to her husband's apartment using some of Versailles' famous secret tunnels that connect many of the rooms together. And then later, the queen decides to go out on the balcony to face the crowd threatening to kill her. She bows her head down in a display of submission, and it momentarily quietens the mob. But the damage is done, and they are not appeased. The mob resumes chanting and hoisting their weapons in the air. And then we see the king and queen sitting relatively alone at dinner in a stark contrast to their life in the beginning of the movie. It's a good scene, but that's not exactly how it happened. In real life, the king and queen did go out on the balcony to greet the mob, but it happened after daybreak, and their children also came out to join them, but the outraged crowd shouted for the children to be removed. And eventually, the king, queen, and their children were whisked away to Paris, never to return to Versailles. The final shots of the movie accurately depict the aftermath of the mob's attack. Queen Marie Antoinette's bedroom, the physical representation of her wealth and luxury, was destroyed. The chandelier ripped from the ceiling, the furniture smashed, the doors ripped off their hinges. It was the end of Marie Antoinette. Lady Antonia Fraser gives a really good analysis of this moment, and I quote, The real work of destruction had been done long before by satire, libel, and rumor. Marie Antoinette had become dehumanized, yeah. the actual assault by a body of people inspiring each other with their bloodthirsty frenzy was the culmination of the process, not the start of it. And with that, this final scene ends the movie. Wow. King Louis XVI was charged with treason and executed by guillotine on January 21st, mm. 1793. Marie Antoinette was charged with depleting the national treasury, conspiracy against the state, and by treason. She was executed by guillotine on October 16th, 1793. Their surviving son, the Dauphin, technically served as King Louis XVII after his father's execution oh, no in early 1793. But since France was controlled by the National Assembly and run as a republic, he never actually ruled. He was kept imprisoned and eventually died from illness in Oof. June of 1795. The eldest daughter, Marie-Therese Charlotte, is the only one who survived the French Revolution. Now Marie Antoinette's story is over, let's finish things off with my impressions of the movie itself. As a period piece, I'm happy to say that the hairstyles and makeup are accurate, as well as the clothes, except for the purposeful inclusion of these Converse All-Stars here. Aside from that, I'd say it deservedly won the Oscar for Best Costume Design in 2007. The general vibe of the Versailles Court is also accurate, which that. obviously shooting on location at the real Versailles will help do that. I mean, it's not always possible to do so, but if you can, accurate. this movie is a perfect example of why you should. The movie soundtrack is new wave and post-punk, which might throw some history buffs off. For me though, I don't particularly nah. mind, it's all down to personal preference, and it helps Sofia Coppola's work stand out. Sophie Coppola? Her choice to use teenage anthems like Bow Wow's I Want Candy, and moody tracks like The Cure's All Cats Are Grey, and Plain Song help break down this 18th century history and makes it relatable to a modern audience. I, I don't know what it is, but the Serpent Queen does actually something similar, especially in season two. As a matter of fact, a lot of the people that I watched it with were complaining about the music in there. And I'm like, it perfectly sets the scene though. It does because the music identifies with the scene. It serves a purpose. It's not to just be like, ooh, look at that music that you've heard before. Ooh, no, it serves the scene. 
In a New York Times interview about her film, Sofia Coppola said, and I quote, I want it to be believable so that it doesn't take you out of the story, but I'm not a fetishist about historical accuracy. I'm just well. making it my thing. And that is definitely true. Mm. Though some lines and quotes are taken directly from their original sources, like letters and journal entries, others are changed or completely made up. There are times when we get historically accurate scenes, like Marie Antoinette at the Opera, or the border crossing ceremony, but then there are the wrong portraits and a missing child. We also need to take into account all of the timeline issues with events happening out of order. Though this movie tries to strike a balance, wow. it sacrifices some history for the sake of aesthetics. Some history buffs may not appreciate the changes to Marie Antoinette's story, but what matters to me more is what's missing. In a movie about her life, it's strange that there's very little shown about her relationship with the common people. It's not as if she never spoke to any. In fact, she was considered very accessible to and caring of her French subjects. And to barely mention all of the political intrigues surrounding her life, which ultimately led to her death, feels like a missed opportunity. But as Sofia Coppola told Vogue in an interview, she felt compelled to interpret Marie Antoinette's life in a way that felt girly and youthful, not academic or overly historical. She was, and I quote, less interested in the political side of history, just like Marie was. So I tried to put in the least amount of politics as possible. It was really fun to take social dynamics from history and interpret them in a way that felt relatable. Uh, and there I you guess. have it. Although the subject Can't of the film was Marie Antoinette, it wasn't meant to be a historical film about a political figure, it was a film about a teenage girl, but one set in pre-revolutionary Versailles. That's what I was thinking. That's exactly the impression that I had, and I thought it wasn't going to be like that for me. But it's still pretty interesting nonetheless. There is still politics in there. It's just more gossip politicking and whatever. And trust me, that's more uh, relatable today than it was back then. Well, that about wraps it up. Yeah, I enjoyed that a hell of a lot more than I thought I would. But again, um, I, I did have a feeling that it was going to be something uh, something like that. Um, yeah, I might actually watch the movie now. Um, but again, <laughs> and it, it, again, it reminds me of Serpent Queen a little bit, just a little bit. It's it's Again, it's Serpent Queen light, I guess, now. Uh, if you guys enjoyed that show, let me know in the comments because I love that show. Uh, and... Yeah, let me know. Did you guys like this movie? Did you guys feel the same way as I did? I know most of you guys are guys, so let me know in the comments. If any of you are girls and you like that, let me know. And uh, please, smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and nerdy content. And subscribe if you don't deserve it. And remember, sign up for my Patreon for all my latest reactions to all my latest videos. And I'll see you in the next episode.